Hey, John. Hi, George. How are you? Good. How are you? You're back. Yep, back from um, Atlanta and San Francisco, and uh, glad to be home. Oh, well, yeah. What did you what, what did you do out there? Well, just very briefly, I'm I'm um, doing some research on uh, for an article on war. I'm not supposed to mention who it's for. Oh, but, um, yeah, right. But, uh, you have to be so, careful about that. Yeah, but anyway, it was fun. I interviewed. Um, a couple of uh, primatologists and a psychologist and an anthropologist and their views were all over the place and so I'm I'm supposed to uh, synthesize all this and come up with a completely coherent and positive view of warfare. Positive? In the next week. Oh, huh. It has to be positive though. Well, I want to be positive. That's, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe you were writing for like a military trade journal or something. <laughs> no, no. I mean, uh, they, wouldn't seem want, likely. they wouldn't want my message because um, it's that war will end. And I'm sure oh. the military trade journals hope that uh, we'll have plenty of war in the oh, future. Oh, right. When you said positive, I thought you meant something about how good warfare was for the economy or something. Oh, I but see. Of course, no. I know that doesn't sound like you. but No, uh, quite the contrary. No, yeah. I'm, a, I'm an old... Uh, I'm an old dove, and so I'm looking forward to the day when uh, war can end. Oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look forward to that. In the last so, last week, we um, did you see the, the the thing we did with Deborah Blom on ghosts? I, I did. Uh, I'm a huge fan of Deborah's. I, yeah, yeah she, she's a she's, really good writer. Yeah, she really is, and, she, and, and very eclectic in her taste. I was really surprised at this uh, recent book of hers on um, ghosts and the paranormal and all this yeah. stuff that uh, scientists, very respectable scientists, were into about 100 years ago. Yeah, it was just fascinating to talk about that. And, um, and it was funny because just like, I think the day after we recorded that, the big front page story in New Mexico, in Santa Fe, was the, the, uh, was this, the story of the courthouse ghost and supposedly something that couldn't be explained scientifically and must be a ghost was spotted on a security camera early in, early in the morning in the district courthouse. And You're kidding. How, what, what, what was the image? What, what did it look like? <laughs> it's, uh, I'll, yeah, we'll, we'll get Bob to, to post this. It's actually made it onto the top 15 of YouTube, apparently. But, you know, you're looking, you're looking at this. I'm actually looking at it now, and you see, you know, security camera looking out at the street, and then suddenly, from the upper right-hand corner, you see this round kind of light, and it sort of hovers, and then it moves down, down the screen, and then it turns, and and it looks like a little little tiny sun or a ghost, you know, you know, looks like a ghost, <laughs> whatever a ghost looks like, and then it goes off the screen, but it's kind of meandering. So this created this huge sensation in the the. Uh, Santa Fe, New Mexican's police reporter talked to all these people at the courthouse, and they came up with these different theories about, oh, well, you know, it's probably one of the disturbed um, ancestors of the Indians who were buried across the street where they're excavating this new convention center. And uh -huh. <laughs> Nobody suggested that it was uh, a UFO escaped from one of the top secret government laboratories where we all know that they're uh, holding these things? Yeah, I'm sure someone suggested that. And <laughs> it seems pretty obvious to me that it's a water drop. Like, I imagine <laughs> that... You know, oh, George, you're <laughs> such a skeptic. I, I think it's a... And no one else seems to have suggested this. They actually had someone from, from uh, the Skeptical Inquirer who <laughs> lives in um, Corrales, New Mexico, and he uh, came out with his ghost-busting kit and... In, in the, today's story, this is like three days running now. We've had front page stories on this. So the one today was, you know, the lead said something like, you know, after doing all these tests, he found no evidence of anything paranormal. Oh, shocks. I just thought that was very funny, though, the idea. I mean, what would evidence of something paranormal be? Well, you know, um, there still are, I mean, as I'm sure you know, um, I, I think probably a majority of people still believe in um, in uh, the paranormal, so ESP yeah. and telekinesis and things like that, and ghosts. I find myself, when I'm at a cocktail party with uh, intelligent, well-educated people, and if the subject gets around to ghosts, uh, I'm always astonished that most people say they believe in ghosts and have a, 
a ghost story that they can wow. trot out as uh, as evidence. And I feel like I'm this really close-minded uh, <laughs> skeptic wow. for not allowing for the possibility of ghosts. Yeah, and, well, I don't know. You'd probably allow for the possibility, wouldn't you, except that, um, you know, it would be something that could in principle be explained at some point down the line scientifically. Well, I don't know. I guess I don't believe, if there's some sort of physical explanation, but um, I don't believe in the possibility of minds without bodies. Oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, no, I don't either. Yeah, I I wasn't using ghosts quite that specifically, but yeah, I guess this little this little um, glowing glowing ball going, you know, <laughs> it's either going out on the street, you know, at a distance, or it's right on the lens, which I think it obviously must be on the lens. And uh-huh. well, some, some people have thought, yeah, some people thought it might be a bug crawling across the lens, just being hit hit by uh, sunlight at a right ang- at the correct angle. But I think a water drop, because you know, capillary action and things would. Uh, you know, could pull it to the right while gravity was maybe pulling it down, and then a little breeze buffeting it the other way. Uh-huh. But it is pretty cool. But I was just, yeah, surprised at how many people their, their immediate uh, their immediate reaction was that to explain it as a ghost when there's all kinds of plausible physical explanations. And well, you know, I, I should say that I went through a period when I was more open-minded about these things. In the uh, late '70s, I was living in Denver, and my um, the girl I was living with at the time was into paranormal stuff, and she convinced me to take a course called You and Me and ESP. It was one of these adult ed courses took place at night at a local community college. And uh, the guy who taught it was, uh, he claimed that he was a, a, a psychiatrist for ghosts. Hmm. So he claimed to see ghosts <laughs> all the time, sort of like in um, Sixth Sense. Yeah. And so he'd be talking to us, and then he he would uh, digress to have these little conversations with ghosts that he said were at the back of the uh, auditorium with who, whom he had a long-standing <laughs> relationship. And he would try to counsel these people on um, getting past the problems that that prevented them from going on and you know merging into the light or whatever it was. Yeah. And I actually I sort of bought this for a while, even though the guy wore these powder blue leisure suits and was really, a, you know, a total ox. <laughs> there, was, there was your tip off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, since then I gradually, you know, after, especially after I went to Scientific American, I just didn't allow for any of that, well, yeah, you know, I mean, that that's, kind of fun stuff. That's, what, that's, that's one of the job requirements, right? <laughs> pretty much. Pretty <laughs> much. <laughs> well, speaking of Scientific American... You know, I'd read, you, you mentioned an article on the origin of life. Yeah. So, God, that's a good article. Yeah, you know, so there actually have been um, several things that have happened recently related to uh, the origin of life. And, yeah. um, you know, even if there, uh, if, if I don't believe in things like like um, ghosts and, uh, and psychokinesis and all this kind of stuff, um, there are still so many really deep mysteries left for science to uh, to wrestle with, and one of them, one of my favorites, is the origin of life. Yeah. Um, so one of the first things that happened was that um, last month, uh, this is just before we went to Santa Fe, Stanley Miller, who's maybe the greatest yeah. experimental science scientist in the history of uh, uh, the origin of life, he just died. Oh. I think I th- he must have been that. 80. He was, he, yeah. was, uh, he was getting up there. And he's the guy who, in 1953, did this famous experiment where um, he mixed, um, uh, let's see, I think it was ammonia, methane, and uh, hydrogen yeah. uh, in a uh, in a beaker and, and uh, mixed them together with water and uh, heated it a little bit and zapped it with uh, electricity to simulate... Um, lightning, lightning, and so this whole setup was supposed to uh, represent the primordial soup four billion years ago. Oh, or the, the at- or was it the early atmosphere? Yeah, the early atmosphere yeah. and uh, the early ocean. And, uh, and then you put some energy in it with lightning bolts. That's right, and yeah. and he sort of let this thing simmer overnight, and he came back in the morning, and there was this kind of black goop in the bottom, and he analyzed it and found that um, 
he had uh, amino acids, yeah. which are the building blocks of uh, proteins, which are the building blocks of life. Nothing crawling around, though. Nothing crawling around, but this was really pretty dramatic, and uh, yeah. it looked at that point as though the origin of life would be solved. I mean, this was a tremendous step forward, and it looked yeah. like the origin of life would be uh, a fairly easy, solvable problem. So the idea would be that it started with RNA and that's well it, at or, this or point, amino uh, acids, which yeah, are the point. are the com components of of RNA or DNA. Well, what, what was interesting in 1953, that was the same year of the famous Watson double helix Crick. paper. That's right. By Watson and Crick. So uh, oh, I hadn't real yeah. So, so so at that point, it was they were just looking at proteins. It was only over the next decade or so that uh, scientists realized that there had to be this combination of uh, nucleic acids right. and proteins to produce So that must have been just, God, it must have felt like everything was coming together, because on one hand you have Watson and Crick showing how, how uh, nucleic acids can have the self-replicating coding mechanisms, and then you have Stanley Miller showing that nucleic acids appear in his beaker when he zaps it with lightning bolts. That's, yeah, and, and one of the puzzles that arose, so then at least they knew that they had the two basic components of life. But then the question was, which arose first? Which um, was it proteins through amino acids, right. or was it uh, was it DNA? Was it um, nucleic oh, acids? Oh, okay. Wait, let me see if I remember this. So, so for amino acids to form, you'd have to have some kind of catalyst that would encourage their formation, and those would presumably be proteins. But well, then to get the proteins, you'd have to have nucleic acids to uh, do the whole DNA replication thing. So you have kind of right. a chick chicken and egg problem. That's that's exactly it. Uh, so to replicate, uh, DNA need, needs uh, proteins, enzymes, which are proteins, and uh, and yet the uh, the proteins are created by DNA. So then the question is, as you said, which came first? And then the big breakthrough came in the early 80s with RNA, which is sort of the messenger molecule yeah. for DNA, and uh, a couple of scientists, Thomas Check and uh, some other guy, they won a Nobel Prize for this, they showed that RNA can serve as its own catalyst. So that led oh. to uh, a, ser a scenario called the RNA world, in which uh, RNA supposedly was the original molecule of life. Okay, so it pulls itself up by its bootstraps and then everything follows from that. Yeah, but the problem is that RNA chemistry is extremely difficult. So chemists can manipulate RNA under uh, very precise laboratory conditions, but the more that people studied RNA under plausible uh, primordial conditions, the harder it was for them to see how RNA could have sort of started uh, self-replicating um, four yeah. billion years ago. So, so like a, it would work if there was like a giant chemist there in the right. beginning. <laughs> yeah, because even in the laboratory, so I guess what, you know, what the promise of Miller's experiment had been in 1953 was that pretty sure we're going, uh, pretty soon we're going to be able to um, replicate the origin of life in a, in a laboratory and show how inanimate uh, molecules, simple organic molecules, can can be put together in such a way that then they begin uh, replicating and evolving on their own. Yeah. But um, it just hasn't worked out that way. Well, yeah, uh, here we are, half a century later, and it's still the big unanswered question in biology. That's right, and, and, and you know, you still have um, people coming up with their own pet theory of how life started and it's in it's in this kind of pre paradigmatic stage where there are all these different competing theories and none seems quite good enough for uh, to really sort of compel everybody's agreement. Yeah, well Shapiro has his own own take on this, right? Yeah, so Shapiro in this um, Scientific American article I mean Shapiro is one of the uh, the old timers in uh, this field, and he started out, uh, at least as far as um, I know, as a kind of skeptic who, who was basically shooting down everybody else's 
uh, theories. He had a book on the origin of life that came yeah, out, I think, in the yeah. late 80s. Yeah, that was, sort of that was really kind of the Bible for you know anyone who wanted to just get a overview of the whole the whole field. Yeah, and I think now he's got a theory that he he um, uh, described in in the Scientific American article uh, involving um, very short, simple molecules that don't start with um, uh, self-replication, but they create a kind of simple uh, metabolic process, a, a kind of yeah. chemical cycle that involves the uh, release and consumption of, of energy, and he thinks that that eventually will lead to uh, more complicated replicating. It's like um, a little proto cell, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you know they they found there there are these certain molecules that if they come together, they'll spontaneously form something like a, a membrane, and then once right. you have this little little enclosure, you can have this metabolism, simple metabolism inside that's sort of protected from the, you know, the the big bad world out there, and then. Um, and, and so you can actually get a cell before you even have any means for it to replicate. So it's more like a bunch of complex chemical reactions that sustain themselves inside this membrane. Yeah, and you know what was interesting about the article is that it. I don't know if you you read all the way to the end. It mentions a um, a, a mutual friend or. or yeah, Stuart Kaufman. Well, also right. Harold Harold Borowitz who. That's but, right. Yeah. Uh, who was another old timer in the uh, this whole uh, origin of life field? But they come out on the. I mean, the, the big question that people want to answer when they're looking at the origin of life is it is is this just a once in eternity and once in the universe fluke, the origin of life on Earth yeah. and then the evolution of life thereafter, or is it a process that emerges quite naturally? Yeah. Out of uh, chemistry that could be found uh, throughout the universe on, a, yeah. on uh, yeah. and that's lots certainly, of other planets. That's certainly Stuart's take, Stuart Kaufman. Yeah, and and Shapiro quotes Stuart at the end of his article, yeah. and uh, basically supports this idea that uh, that the origin of life was something that you would expect, and it does arise naturally out of chemistry. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's why you know Stuart called his book "At Home in the Universe." And yeah. The idea was that life was not some; it was like something natural that was encouraged by the uh, laws of physics and the laws of thermodynamics to arise, like these little pockets of order, like the little proto cells. Yeah. Um, so at the end of uh, the article uh, by Shapiro, he he quotes first he quotes Jacques Minot, who was more in the camp of life is highly. Re Improbable. Yeah, chance and necessity. That's and right. That, that's that's just one of my favorite books. And he says, uh, yeah, I would think that it would be a favorite book of, of uh, yours because it has a kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, it, it emphasizes the improbability of of life and how we're just here through an incredible stroke of luck. Yeah, so you're a fluke saying, of the universe. Right. <laughs> the universe was not pregnant with life, Minot says, nor the biosphere with man. Our number came up in the Monte Carlo game. I love that. Then, so Shapiro basically rejects that point of view yeah. and says that uh, his, Shapiro's view, is in harmony with the views of biologist Stuart Kaufman. And he quotes from At Home in the Universe. Mm -hmm. if this Which, is I, I should add as a disclaimer that I helped Stuart write At Home in the Universe. That's so. right, and that was yeah. why it, um, it was such a uh, wonderful um, read. I mean, you know, <laughs> thanks. No offense to Stewart, but no, Stewart's a great, great writer. So we, but he he's very excessive, and um, he could so. use some help from a pro. Well, yeah, it was a good collaboration, really. I was more of his uh, more of his editor, and just kind of whipping him into line, and sort of letting Stewart be Stewart, but not going off the cliff with it too many times. Well, so tell me if you uh, wrote this this sentence from Stewart, or these this okay. these couple of sentences, <laughs> if this is all true. Life is vastly more probable than we have supposed. Not only are we at home in the universe, but we are far more likely to share it with as yet unknown companions. Yeah, no, that's that's pure Stuart, and it's an it's, inspiring thought. But um, do you believe it? Well, I, as I said, I'm more of a more of a chance and necessity 
kind of guy, but uh, I think it's possible. But uh, you know, then there, there's the old uh, who was it, who was it that uh, the famous scientist who asked, uh, "Well, where off was it? Fermi? Where are they? Where are they? Exactly. Yeah, the where are they? Question. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, you know, this Shapiro article reminded me a lot of the uh, the talk we heard at the Santa Fe Institute by that guy Eric Smith. Yeah, he had actually recommended that to the students to, to read as a really good primer. Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, I mean, okay. To me, that article was just, that's, that's just like the best of Scientific American. You know, when you, you, get, you get a piece like that, it's just... That's so, right. Yeah, even if you don't agree with the complete take, it's, you know, it's literate, intelligent, and yet it, um, you know, assumes that um, it's being read by intelligent people that are willing to think, so it doesn't dumb it down. Yeah, it, um, it, it's interesting that this article, I don't know if you, you noticed, it, it, it points out that it was originally published online yeah. as a kind of experiment by Scientific American, and uh, and then they solicited all this commentary, and they, they got yeah. a lot. And I as a result, that. they modified the article and included some responses in this um, hard copy uh, oh. published Version. Yeah, I didn't see the hard copy. I just saw the soft copy. So this is uh, this is a um, that's a horrible thought, isn't it? What if <laughs> this becomes the trend, and every time we write a story, not only do we have to deal with you know this endless hierarchy of editors at whatever magazine you're dealing with, but you know thousands and thousands of people in the public, you know the pu thousands of thousands of members of the public coming in and you know saying, oh no, I think you should say it this way, and. Uh, is that that's a nightmare to you? I mean, oh. I thought this is the whole this is uh, yeah. herd knowledge, wiki knowledge, <laughs> which exceeds what any puny individual can arrive at. I do. I, yeah, I really am impressed with Wikipedia. And in fact, just yesterday, I, I made a correction to an article in Wikipedia. Oh, really? Yeah, on the uh, the Henry Draper uh, catalog of. Uh, of, of spectral stellar types or something. And they, I, I was actually looking on Wikipedia to confirm something for an article I was writing, and then I noticed they misdescribed the, uh, the Draper catalog as only covering the northern hemisphere stars, but it also covers the southern hemisphere. So I fixed good, it. <laughs> good for you, you public servant, you. But I've heard, yeah. though, what happens with Wikipedia sometimes is Jaron Lanier is has written about this. He says that in his own entry, with somebody else wrote, mm -hmm. it keeps referring to him as a um, a filmmaker because he had very briefly been involved in some kind of documentary years ago. Yeah. Uh, but he's not a filmmaker. Yeah. And that's that's just not an accurate description of him. And he said several times he's gone and corrected it. And, and then someone he looks changes at, it back. <laughs> yeah, he, somebody keeps changing it back, and after he after a while, he just gave up. So. Well, you know, the whole great thing is you can actually go go down a layer in Wikipedia and you can see the page where people discuss the uh, the edits. And, you know, they say, well, you know, this person just changed it back, but I think he's wrong, and now I'm going to change it back the other way. And uh -huh. So yeah, I, I love that great collaboration, but I really don't like the idea of, of having all the, having any more editors than, than I already <laughs> do. <laughs> That's true. Hey, I mean, you know, eventually they could just dispense with individual writers entirely and just have uh, artificial intelligence programs that yeah. just collect snippets of uh, information from uh, from people on the web and put together articles. What do they need us for? No, I mean, at the, at the very best, it's all just going to be blogs, I think. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I well, mean, as I far as this whole idea of having an article where you work weeks and weeks on it and reason through it and figure out the best possible way to do it and then you work with a few really good editors that you know help you say what you want to say and ideally make it better which uh, is often often really true you know and all of that seems to be just going by the wayside now and people just want this kind of off the cuff sort of thing where you sit down and type whatever flitted into your brain that morning or you talk about it on blogging heads too <laughs> <laughs> Hey, uh, I just wanted to hammer, <laughs> I just wanted to hammer home this point about the origin of what. Yeah, you know, sorry, I, I didn't mean to get off of that. Well, tangent. well, that's all right. Just to just to sort of give the punchline. I, you know, yeah. I did a big article for Scientific American. It was published in '91 uh, on um, uh, 
on the origin of life. And I interviewed Stanley Miller and Francis Crick and Leslie Orgel, these people who were giants in the, yeah. the field of the origin of life. And Miller was sort of um, despairing that uh, there would be any solution. He sort of went through all the major theories one by one and uh, showed that they were all um, fatally flawed. Mm -hmm. And um, as far as I can tell from uh, reading the article by Shapiro and um, hearing that presentation by Eric Smith at the Santa Fe Institute, we're still in that same situation. So these guys both have all these sort of theoretical arguments that the origin of the li of the origin of life should be occurring all the time throughout the universe. Um, it's really not uh, something that is highly improbable. But as you say, then, well, where are all the aliens? Yeah, we haven't yeah. discovered life anywhere else in this solar system. Uh, we certainly haven't discovered it anywhere else in, um, yeah. in the universe. Not only that, it's just that in laboratories, nobody has come close to showing a logical sequence of chemical steps that lead from inanimate chemistry to, um, to biology. Yeah. Well, you know, and this is exactly the kind of stuff that the intelligent design people use, though, right, to say that there had to be, had to be some sort of intervening intelligence. Yeah, the, the original subtitle for my article in um, Scientific American was, Psst, don't tell the creationists, <laughs> but Ooh. scientists don't have a clue how life began. That probably Not, didn't survive the editor. <laughs> no, no way. I was really proud of that. I wish I had stuck to my guns and yeah. gotten that through, but my editor at the time, Jonathan Peel, uh, said... Oh, he's um, famous. Absolutely uh, no way. Actually, at the time, we were involved in a, uh, in a kind of a dispute with a person who had wanted to be uh, a columnist and briefly was a columnist, a guy named Forrest Mims, um, who turned oh, yeah. out... Who turned out to be? He wanted to. He did the um, amateur scientist called it. And he turned out to be a uh, yeah. a devout Christian and a creationist. And so yeah. Jonathan Peel was really sensitive about anything that sort of touched on. Uh, well, I can understand that, that. I mean, I yeah. it's just amazing. I mean, as you know, every time you write something about this, I did an essay once for the this the Week in Review, the New York Times, and. It was um, dur during one of the flare-ups of the of the creationism debate, and 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 back when you know the the big shibboleth you kept hearing was well evolution's just a theory, it's just a theory, and um, of course not really understanding that for something to be a theory in science is a huge deal. I mean it's as good as it gets, and then just writing this essay, just saying well you know sure scientists should just use this as a uh, Means of teaching people what science is really about, that everything is tentative and, you know, and in principle could be overturned, overturned the next day. And of course, evolution is a theory and that this is a compliment and not an insult. Yeah. And then I was just, you know, and, and I did it in a fairly, fairly subtle way because, you know, when you're right about this stuff, it's just so easy to make fun of the opposition and, and, and it really backfired. You know, one thing you learn is that a lot of people just don't don't get irony, or, or maybe I just didn't convey it ironically enough. But yeah. I got this all these emails, and they were divided pretty much fifty fifty between um, you know the usual ones from fundamentalists saying that I was part of the atheistic secular humanistic conspiracy, and then the other half from scientists or or science uh, scientifically minded people. Um, condemning me for undermining science, and what <laughs> one of them began, I thought the day would never come when I pick up my New York Times and read that evolution is just a theory. <laughs> so you do uh, have to be careful with this stuff. But you know, and that, what I kept thinking when I was reading that Shapiro article, what impressed me is, you know, all these they're saying these are scientifically minded people. So even after, even though after half a century, no one can explain the origin of life through what we know about science, these people aren't saying, well, that means there must be a supernatural, you know, you, you know, like explaining the little water drop on the courthouse lens as a ghost. They're saying that, well, we can't do it, and maybe, you know, the human brain has not evolved and never, you know, will be at the point where it can do this, but uh, we still believe with all our hearts that there's uh, a scientific explanation out there in principle. 
You know, um, and this is just what you know that, that that Stanley Fish essay that was in the Times. Oh yeah. You know, and he it, it, that's just what he was saying that you know the scientists too have their own faith and the atheists have their own faith. He was really not saying science so much, but well, yeah, he was because he was talking about Richard Dawkins. But to me, he kind of took that and twisted it into this very postmodern kind of brilliantly specious argument. Yeah, I found that piece really annoying. I, yeah. I, you know, the, the idea that, I mean, certainly there are elements of faith in science. Faith that um, science will solve certain problems um, that right now look um, insurmountable. But after all, that's a faith that's, that is built on science's extraordinary success at solving problems in the past. Yeah, and, it's you just know, a I faith that things are explicable. Yeah, that's, that's right, and indeed. that they will be explicable within certain boundaries. And you know, the kind of faith that uh, religious people have is 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 um, uh, comes from a surrender, I think, yeah. to certain mysteries. Now, I do think that there are mysteries out there that will never be solved. The origin oh, yeah. of life might yeah. be one, but just yeah. because science can't solve them, doesn't mean we should fall back on these ridiculous old superstitious yeah. explanations that, that religion has given us over the past Well, yeah, that's something that Richard Dawkins said that really struck me when we were in Cambridge two summers ago, and he says, well, you know, it's true that science so far hasn't been able to answer these questions, and maybe it can't answer these questions, but that certainly doesn't mean that they're going to be answered by theologians. No. No, I completely agree. <laughs> but see, you one know, of the things that, that Fish was, was was arguing was that, you know, basically science cannot critique religion because it's coming from, you know, a separate sphere. And, you know, this is sort of the point that I made over and over in Fire in the Mind, that science and religion are immiscible like oil and water, and they just, you know, really don't overlap and can't, can't mix. But the, the thing that I think Fish misses is that... Uh, you know, the, these religious people are making statements about the material world and the nature. They're making scientific truth statements, as I think, Absolutely. think Dawkins put it. So they are intruding, you know, across this, you know, supposed firewall. Yeah, um, you know, so even when it comes to the question of miracles, you remember when we were at that Templeton Fellowship, there were people there, highly uh, educated, intelligent people, who believed in miracles? They yeah. believed that well, God John, answers. Yeah, in, including God John Polkinghorne. I'm sorry, I didn't mean in, to. Cut yes, you off. including John Polkinghorne and um, uh, Ru um, Russell Stannard, I think is his yeah. name. Yeah, yeah, scientists. Uh, who um, you know told me a story about uh, when God had answered his prayer to save a, a child who had cancer. So, yeah. you know, these sort of sorts of things are actually testable. And, in fact, the Templeton Foundation, to its credit, uh, has car carried out a study of the efficacy of prayer. And, in fact, one of the students at the Santa Fe Institute was, oh, yeah. uh, was one of the principal investigators who was involved in that. Um, yeah, I briefly mentioned that to Deborah, but, yeah, that was interesting. Because yeah, he was a, he's actually a medical doctor and was involved with some of the tests. That's right. Menage... Yeah, maybe, you know, Jane. Yeah, and and he didn't, you know, he definitely got got the impression from him that the Templeton people, including the scientists running the study, were not at all happy about the results. That prayer didn't show that it had any helpful effect, and in fact <laughs> showed a statistically significant harmful effect. Yeah, that um, I'm I'm hoping he had. He wanted to write an article on the whole history of that experiment, yeah. which I thought would be fascinating. I, yeah, I did too. I gave him uh, a um, contact at Scientific America, which I think would be a great place for that to be uh, yeah. published, because that's a really interesting episode in the whole history of of this recent sort of tension between uh, science and religion. Yeah, yeah. But uh, just one more quote on the, um, yeah, on the origin of life. Uh, Francis Crick wrote a book called, um, I think it was called Life Itself, yeah, uh, it about right. the origin of life. Right. And uh, I forget yeah. if it was in that book or um, in a paper out of which the book grew. He says that um, something to the effect that the origin of life seems almost a miracle. So many are the conditions that would have to be satisfied for it to occur. 
Yeah. Uh, so he just pointed out that there are certain chemical processes and just the basic availability of certain chemicals that you find in, um, in modern life that were not available and are highly uh, difficult to recreate even in a laboratory. And so he can't, now Crick was uh, as hard a core and atheist as um, even Francis, Cr as uh, Richard Dawkins. Oh, yeah. Say. But he came up with what was sort of the materialist version of a uh, almost a uh, religious explanation for the origin of life, which is mm -hmm. directed panspermia. Right. So he thought that that life must have started elsewhere in the universe, and then aliens uh, seeded came to the earth and left the seeds for life here, and that's the most yeah. probable explanation. <laughs> which is just postponing the problem. And, yeah. You know, you're just putting it up a meta level, which is really sort of what the religious explanations do. That, you know, you, you, can, you can say it's God, but then, you know, how do you have to have a theory to explain God and, you know, onward with the infinite regress. Well, Eric, Eric Smith at Santa Fe, he was very disparaging toward uh, directed panspermia. Yeah. But, you know, that could be the explanation. Well, I mean, yeah, just I mean, I guess it's unsatisfying. Yeah. It doesn't mean that it's not correct. Yeah, but but what what does it buy you? I mean, I guess if you could you could show that the while while the conditions don't exist on Earth that would make these chemical formations likely, that they do exist in other places of the universe. And yeah, well, you know, one of the best the way that I think the origin of life field will be blown wide open. Maybe the only way is if we find life somewhere else, sure. anywhere else. Sure. So if we find it on Mars, or we find oh, it on yeah. uh, Europa, or if maybe an asteroid comes by and we find uh, uh, microbes um, yeah. on that, then we can have a comparison, because all these probability issues are, are extremely difficult to solve when you have only one data point. <laughs> yeah, but if we have right. um, life elsewhere, then we can compare that life to this life. Maybe it's got an entirely different replicating process. Um, yeah. Maybe it's got something that's that uh, you know looks lot, nothing like nucleic acids. Yeah. Maybe it's got a scaffolding that's nothing like uh, proteins. Or maybe it's very similar. Yeah. I mean, either way, you'd really learn something that would be, um, that would help you answer this whole question of whether life is a fluke or whether it's in some sense um, inevitable. And which aspects of life uh, here on Earth are um, are sort of natural and which are very uh, peculiar and idiosyncratic. Well, yeah, maybe it'll be the the intelligent, uh, thinking stellar cloud, like in Fred Hoyle's novel. The, I think it's called the Black Cloud or something. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Fred Hoyle was another one. Yeah, he was the um, you know the famous um, astronomer and astrophysicist, and he also became convinced that, that life was so improbable that. There, you know, something miraculous was involved. Yeah, he had this great metaphor. Oh, he was the Boeing, yeah. The, 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 um, the uh, that imagining that life occurred on Earth through natural processes is like thinking that a tornado could come through a junkyard and and leave a 747 in its wake. Yeah, which is also another pretty specious argument. But, <laughs> I mean... That, that's what's impressive about this research that Shapiro is describing in the Scientific American article. It shows you how, how little simple pockets of complexity and structure can indeed easily arise. Yeah. So except, uh, so except I'm waiting for them to I'm waiting for them to show how it can lead to life in a laboratory. Yeah, when they well, get sure, to that, that would be yeah. The, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think yeah, it, it, may, it may never be answered, but. Um, you know, we're talking about finding life elsewhere in the universe. Now, imagine that we find intelligent life that has science and um, a religion, or not. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that would really would really be an interesting interesting data point. Um, you know, I, I once had a conversation with Edward Witten, the great superstring yeah. theorist. Some people say is the smartest scientist since not only Einstein but yeah. Newton. And uh, we got into this conversation. It was funny because he started off the conversation berating me for deliberately being too provocative in my writings. And then he started talking about what kind of science aliens would discover 
yeah. which I thought was rather provocative in its own right. Well, it and gets down to the whole question, you know, the whole Platonism versus Aristotelian view of reality. Is, are there these pre-existing truths out there or, well, he or is, not, or do we he, just make it up? Witten, probably like most theoretical physicists and certainly most mathematicians, is a Platonist. He insisted yeah. that any advanced civilization in the universe would eventually discover string theory as yeah. the basic theory of the material world. Yeah, well, they, they, if it's if it's right, that should be the case, or they should at least uh, you know agree on the value of pi, <laughs> right? You know, or e, or some of these these numbers. But um, it, it would be very interesting. Obviously, I mean, what an understatement! It would be very interesting if we found intelligent life ah, in the God. universe and could see if they have have pi and e and natural base logarithms and are the equivalent, or if it's just completely you know incommensurable and doesn't translate. And, it would also be nice yeah. to know if they believe in the golden rule. <laughs> well, they have yeah. an epi- well, that, we might never have a chance to yeah. learn that. They might annihilate us before uh, we learn anything about them. About yeah, them. and if they believe in you know a god similar to the monotheistic gods of the great the great earthling religions, it would be really quite a quite a challenge for theologians. And you know, that, for some reason, it reminds me. There was this essay by. Tillard de Chardin. Yeah, uh, right. I, 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 I'm sure I'm mangling that pronunciation. Yeah, we yeah we mangled it before. Here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, maybe I mentioned this before. The this Omega Point. On whether, uh, yeah, the Omega Point theory. But he also wrote an essay on whether Christ died not only for our sins but also for the sins of aliens. Yeah, that's and a good, he speculated on whether question. alien civilizations would each need their own savior or whether Christ is the savior for everybody in the whole cosmos. Yeah, yeah, boy. There's an interesting question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I just don't, just really. It's the, the it just amazes me that that uh, modern secular universities still have departments of theology. But <laughs> well, <laughs> we should get into people, that another time. Yeah, we wanted to talk still to study. Beowulf, so why not? Yeah, okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, ju- junk DNA? Is that what yeah, you, you know, there was about? that article. Yeah, and I, I had actually meant to, to get into this with Deborah, but we just got, you know, too involved with ghosts. But, you know, again, you know, talking about, you know, great unsolved problems, and, and here one that they thought they had solved is just the whole thing with, with DNA and DNA replication and the blueprint of life. And there were stories all over the press in the last. 10 days about this big study that found that the so-called junk DNA, which we've heard for years and years, is just sort of this detritus that does nothing in our genome and just is carried along along for the ride, that all of this is actually being transcribed into uh, proteins and sending out signals and may have this this very important role in, in uh, regulating the uh, genomic expression inside cells. It's just the it's just the most startling, startling outcome. Yeah, that that story was. Um, you know, I, I I rely so much for my science news on the New York Times, and I didn't see anything about this yeah. in the Times, and I only. Uh, Read the Washington Post story this morning when you sent me. Uh, yeah, Rick Weiss. He had a really good. His was the best, I think. It was. I mean, this sounds momentous. It sounds, yeah. you know. So you had the, you know, as we were saying before, the structure of DNA was um, was uncovered in 1953 by Crick and Watson, and within the next decade, uh, especially Crick with this other group of people figured out the genetic code, how specific um, sequences uh, in, a, in a DNA molecule encode for very specific proteins. It was this highly logical, incredibly elegant, and seemingly simple system yeah, uh, responsible simple. for um, building organisms out of a very simple blueprint. And I, I guess what's happening now is that that sim- apparent simplicity and elegance is giving way to um, horrendous complexity. Yeah, yeah. So that seemed to be one of the messages of that story. You know, I I just got a a new issue of the Economist that I thought was a nice complement to that piece. It's this uh-huh. one here by uh, 
you can't see it, but it says um, Biology's Big Bang, and it's got the um, the Sistine Chapel picture of God's hand and, and Adam's <laughs> hand, and, and then the gap between them is a string of, I guess what it, it's supposed to be is uh, RNA. So no. what this story is about is how... Um, you know, RNA is supposed to be this uh, a kind of gopher for DNA. Right. Uh, just just carrying the instructions from the DNA uh, and uh, allowing it to um, produce proteins, um, and has supposedly this sort of lowly job. Yeah. And now it looks like, according to this article, they think that RNA may in some ways be even more central to. Um, the operation of a cell than DNA is. Yeah, yeah. So it's, you know, <laughs> yeah, paradigms it's like turning are it on its head. Yeah, and then with the junk, finding out that the junk DNA isn't really junk. I mean, to me, that's equivalent to reading an article saying they've just found that all of the neural processing going on in the brain is being done by the glial cells instead of the neurons. Yeah, it, <laughs> you, you know, know the glial cells are just kind of these, these structural nutritive support systems. But yeah, it's just like you're, you know you're reversing what we thought was figure and ground. Yeah, um, I mean not reversing in the case of junk DNA. It just adds some more complexity. Well, this might also explain why, you know, there there have been these repeated um, failures to find. So back in the late '80s, early '90s. Um, the advances in uh, biotechnology and and uh, and um, figuring out the human genome led people to think that they could find single genetic mutations that were responsible for some fairly complex yeah. diseases, and that has turned out to be much more difficult than anybody. Well, yeah, thought. yeah, we, we we've talked about that, and yeah, um, and then, yeah. You know, genetic but, you know, therapy the same way has turned out to be. Uh, just not nearly as simple as anyone thought, yeah. and it looks like some of these recent findings may be may explain in part why some of those simple explanations and simple treatments haven't been uh, very effective. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, I mean, one of the points in, in Rick's article was that you know it's more like we're not looking at the gene anymore as this discrete little thing, you know, inside the. Um, the DNA string, but that the gene is more like this concept that could be spread all over the genome with all these little parts interacting, and you know it's not so modular. Um, the way he put it was, um, um, altogether the new project shows that the simple sequence of DNA letters revealed to great fanfare by the three billion dollar Human Genome Project was but a skeletal version of the Human Construction Manual. It's the alphabet, but not much more for a syntactically complicated language of life that scientists are just now beginning to learn. Yeah, uh, nice writing. Yeah, then he quotes a, a guy, um, the uh, Eric Green, at the, um, the scientific director of, of this NIH Institute for Genome Research, and he says it's like trying to read and understand a very complicated Chinese novel. Uh -huh. <laughs> I like that, but... Yeah, it's it's just really really quite stunning. Yeah, it's interesting. I wonder if uh, so. I guess the hope is that this um, they will reach a sort of new understanding of how this complexity works, and that that will lead to maybe more complex but more effective um, genetic treatments for complex diseases like heart disease or yeah. schizophrenia and so forth. Yeah, and just, I mean, that's certainly why they, they get a lot of government money. But, you know, of course, the main thing is to just to, you know, figure out this mystery of, of how it all works. Oh, pure understanding instead of practical consequences? Yeah, yeah. Don't you hate that when you're writing a story, you know, about, say, super string theory or, or quantum mechanics, and then the editor says, well, you know, somewhere around the fourth paragraph we need to say what the practical applications are. <laughs> at Scientific American, at least when we were writing about super string theory, uh, I would tell them, look, Steve Weinberg uh, told me that uh, there are absolutely no practical consequences 
of particle physics anymore, let alone strong Well, that's what makes it so and, wonderful. Yeah. So I'm not going to put any, I'm not going to pretend that there are any in this <laughs> article. And that was usually good enough for my editors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can usually get away with that with, with, with certain things in physics. But, you know, it just always annoys me because the implication is that the only value of science is that uh, if it comes up with ways to improve our material comfort or if somebody can make money out of it. Right. You know, it's, it's, it should be, you know, the whole idea is just to understand. Yes, I agree. But sometimes, let's say uh, you want to understand, but you have a terminal disease. Well, no, uh, it's definitely a good spinoff. <laughs> so obviously, I mean, you know, certainly, you know, the understand, understanding cancer, and, you know, we've made, you know, depending on how you measure it, in some ways we've made, you know, really, really great progress, and in others, none at all. Hey, um... I think we have time for one more huge yeah. mystery that we've covered before, uh, the neural code. Oh, yeah, another great Scientific American article just, just came out in July. Yeah, so I don't know if, you know, I subscribe to Scientific American, and um, I haven't gotten the July issue yet. So I yeah, guess I got it on the, you know, now you can get it on, you can get the whole issue on the web by PDF. Oh really? Yeah, well, they charge you five bucks for it. But I, I, a friend of mine, just who works there, just sent me sent me a copy, and uh, and and the and actually uh, there's a um, a dialogue in there between Richard Dawkins and, and Lawrence Krauss about you know should scientists be nice to religious people? But uh, um, oh, there's it's, a it's, balanced twosome. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, you know, Krauss is more much more moderate. Yeah, you know, he's really the moderate there, but 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 you know it's a really great dialogue. But but uh, what struck me was this article by this guy, uh, uh, someone else's name to mangle. Joe uh, Sen. Yeah, Chen. Yeah. yeah. So I I got a friend at Siam to email me this thing too. So I'm, oh. just, I'm just holding it up to the screen. Oh, good, good, good. We're so, so well I'll, connected here. Yeah, I I yeah, I don't know if we'll have, be able to uh, provide a link for. Um, Blogging heads, listeners, but yeah, this was know. this was really a fascinating piece, and I I don't know if you recollect this is the second big article on the neural code, which as you know I think is the single biggest solvable problem in science right now. Yeah, I remember that scientific you said American that. Yeah. has run in the last six months. So this is another one that came out last December, and um, this is by a. The, the one last December was by a guy named Miguel Nicolelis, and I think it's a graduate student mm -hmm. uh, of his. Um, who, he's one of the people who's involved in doing these experiments showing how you can read signals from the brain of a monkey and oh, get okay. it to, uh, and it will learn how to control a robotic arm. Yeah, right. So these, yeah, these that was the previous people. article, right? That's right. And he's yeah. done he's done yet other articles for Scientific American back a ways. But this new article by Sen, I thought in some ways was better than the Nicolaitis article because it was more sort of comprehensive. It gave a better yeah. overview of this whole... And wonderfully specific about how, how a neural code might, you know, how the brain might actually encode specific memories. Yeah, you know, but both of these articles failed to mention something that I think is really crucial. They... they and I think it's it's because they both sort of look at uh, a fairly high level of neural signaling. They look, especially in the Sen article, he talks about these um, uh, cliques of neurons, yeah. groups groups of neurons that he, he calls cliques. That uh, C L I Q U E S. That's like right. The, like like the cool kids that hang out. Yeah, uh, that encode specific um, memories. Yeah. But what they didn't get at there, there's this fundamental debate going on in uh, neuroscience over um, how information is encoded at the individual neural level. Yeah. So um, the conventional thinking actually for the past 60 or 70 years has been that the only important information conveyed by single cells is the rate of firing of the cell. Yeah. So is it firing at, you know, 10 times a second, right. 150 times a second, or so forth. It's only that rate that's important. But just over the past five years, and, and you know, if you think about it, rate is a very inefficient 
way to encode information. So it would be like mm -hmm. having um, a conversation or having a language in which information is encoded only with the amplitude of your voice. You can only uh, say something to somebody else by getting louder or softer. Yeah, or, or a different frequency. Or the frequency, one or the yeah. other, but not yeah. both. Uh, and yeah. so there are some people recently who've been uh, providing both theoretical models and some experimental evidence uh, for what are called temporal codes. Mm -hmm. So in a temporal code, instead of looking at the overall, the average rate of um, pulses traveling through a neuron over a period of time, you're looking at the specific um, timing between individual pulses. And so okay. it's more like almost yeah. like a, a Morse code type system. Yeah. And, if, and if you can encode information in this way, you can encode exponentially larger amounts of information. Right. So there's this guy named uh, William Bialek at Princeton, who's sort of a physicist, biophysicist slash biologist, who has been working on uh, temporal coding schemes and showing how they can explain uh, some of the... Uh, uh, perception and memory uh, of uh, insects, for example, and he's mm -hmm. pretty sure that this is happening in mammals and in humans as well. Wow, that's fascinating. But I was just a little disappointed. And and well, Chan's doing a different kind of thing. He's talking more about of a spatial kind of code, right? Where it's just uh, how the neurons are recruited into these patterns that stand for things in the outside world. Yeah, so he's he's basically assuming that rate is the basic coding mechanism at the level of individual Well, yeah, neurons. the first order of approximation, but you know, once he you know, develops this theory and someone else is developing a temporal theory, you could imagine them, them you know, really coming together into, into some you know, very, very complex kind of coding mechanism. Yeah. Well, what I love about the temporal coding possibility is that it suggests that it, you know, it just instantly vastly boosts the brain's information processing yeah. capability. Yeah, but even you know, even if the uh, even if every neuron in the brain was just a binary processor like in a computer, and all it could do was one or zero, firing or not firing, when you have a trillion of those that are connected in such intricate ways, that already is a huge amount of information processing. And That's true. It, and then, if in addition, you can. Um, you know, the signals between the neurons can vary according to this temporal code. You know, wow. You know, well, there are, amazing. you know, there, there's a guy, you know, the neural code, or the rate code is still the dominant paradigm. And there's this guy named uh, William Newsom, I think it, uh, he's called, at uh, Stanford. I had a conversation with him about temporal codes versus rate codes. And he argued, basically, that, when you know, when you've got millions or even billions of neurons, you don't need a temporal code to explain the, uh, the complexity uh, of information processing. So he was sure that this temporal coding stuff was just uh, a, a flash, you know, sort of a theoretical fad that was eventually going to fade away. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that Scientific American or someone will have an article on rate versus temporal codes. Yeah, I'd love uh, to read it. Soon. Yeah, because, you know, to maybe me you should it's write really it. It's, it's an interesting issue. Yeah. No, it's too hard. Too hard. Oh, I, can't. Okay. I mentioned it a little bit in this article I did for Discover that I've already linked to on some yeah. of our Well, we'll get Sandy to do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's, yeah, she's, she's our brain person here on Blogging Heads. So. Yes, let Sandy do it. Yeah. yeah. That stuff is hard. Oh. You know, I talked to this guy, Tian. I just realized I'd completely forgotten this all about... Maybe ten years ago, and I was doing a piece uh, for Time magazine that, that that Philip DeWitt asked me to do, sort of um, getting people up to speed and what science has learned about how memory works. And this was when Cien had done. Remember the smart mouse? Oh yeah, the Doogie Mouse. The, the Doogie, Doogie Mouse. Mouse. Yeah, apparently there was a TV show called Doogie Hauser with a real smart little kid. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and, and the thing was, you know, in the brain, what one of the things they've discovered about uh, how, how memories are formed in the brain is that it seems to involve these things called NMDA receptors. Mm -hmm. So basically if you have two neurons that are connected by a synapse and both of them fire at the same time according to 
you know what's called uh, you know this theory by Hebb, you know, yeah. called a Hebbian synapse. So if two, so so neurons that are neurons that fire together are wired together. Mm -hmm. That's how they put it. So you have these two neurons, and they fire at the same time, and then as a result, they form a stronger link between them, and the NMDA receptors are involved in this. So I think they did, with the smart mouse, they did some genetic alteration that uh, made it easier for it to produce NMDA receptors, or some, somehow the neural tissue had more NMDA receptors. I can't remember the details, but the result was that the uh, mouse could learn learn much better than your average mouse. Yeah, I remember that got a tremendous amount of attention because yeah. it, it was just, it, it, it was sort of fuel for the fire uh, uh, related to all these um, uh, discussions of designer babies. You know, can we, oh, uh, yeah. if you can have smart mice, why not smart kids? Why not smart smarter? kids? Wow, what a concept. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but but what was neat to me about this, I mean, when I wrote that piece for Time Magazine, I made this point that it was the same point I made when I wrote in the Palaces of Memory, that, you know, how we're starting to understand all these mechanisms about how the brain forms memories, but it's really almost impossible to imagine we'll get to the time when we can say that, uh, you know, the idea of... Uh, of a tree looks this way in your brain. You know, it, it's, it's this kind of pattern of neurons, or the, you know, the picture of your uh, of, of your your dog in your brain, or the model of the dog in your brain looks like this neurologically. And and I just always assumed that there's no way anyone's going to get even close to answering that question in my lifetime. And yet here you have this guy Tian, who's really come up with uh, a way to think about that. Anyway, he may turn out to be wrong, but I was just, it, to me, it was one of the more interesting things I'd read about, uh, you know, the neurophysiology of memory in a long time. Well, First I have to say, different. the the um, the one thing there are a couple of things that bothered me about his article. I thought that he was a little bit too. I thought he glossed over the difficulty of um, mind reading. So he's got a little box on mind reading. Well, yeah. And yeah. Uh, and then at the very end, and, and you know, I think mind reading, I think there's going to be a certain completely idiosyncratic aspect to the neural coding in any individual brain. Yes, there's going to be universal yes, principles, exactly. but individual memories will be encoded in a way that is completely context dependent. And so the only way you could really read people's minds is, is if you are constantly interrogating them and getting them to tell you what they're thinking while you're monitoring their brain, and you need to monitor the entire brain. He's only looking yeah. at the hippocampus. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, maybe yeah. many other parts of the brain are involved in yeah. encoding no. memories. Yeah. I think that they probably are. No, that, the, that struck me too. I'm glad you mentioned that because, to, yeah, to me it seems more plausible that unlike the genetic code, you know, which is universal throughout the, uh, the biosphere, presumably, I mean, maybe now we'll learn it's not, but um, the neural code, it seems like it would be different for every person. Like, like the brain would basically develop a code for, you know, talking between neurons and forming these patterns and these representations of the world, but it may not, you know, and it would, there would theoretically be a way to map that onto someone else's neural code, but, um, you know, the thought that you can just have, you know, some sort of out-of-the-box device that would read read mind seems pretty far-fetched. Well, not only that, even with individuals, the neural code for particular representations oh. constantly changes as you, as you yeah. get new experience. And this is one of the interesting things that's come out of some of this research by Nicol Ellis and John Chapin and some other people who are doing these experiments trying to you know basically read the thoughts of monkeys to get them to control computers and so forth. The coding, even for these very simple tasks, keeps changing. Yeah. And so this is a result of oh. you know neuroplasticity, the big buzzword in uh, neuroscience. So yeah. the neural code is a moving target, even oh. with individuals. It not only varies between individuals; it varies in single people. Oh, so, so it'd be a little like 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 the neural code in your head. You could imagine being like. Um, like the English language, or maybe more like all the languages of the world going back to, you know, the, the mother tongue and then evolving over these centuries in all these different ways. And you can imagine the neural code in your head over a lifetime going through all these changes and evolutions and 
recoding yeah, it's, itself. It's constantly evolving, which I think is yeah. you know one, and that's one reason actually why our brains work as well as they do, because I think our va- our brains are constantly inventing new coding systems for different tasks. So we're not locked into to just one code. That's right. But the what the thing, and maybe then you know we should close this. Let's see, what, 104. Oh yeah. But uh, you know at the very end, Sen comes up with a Ray Kurzweil scenario. You know Ray Kurzweil is yeah. the uh, the sort of transhumanist guru who says that we're going to um, be transformed into robots or God knows what soon. So Sen goes. Could it be that 5,000 years from now we will be able to download our minds into computers, travel to distant worlds, and live forever in the network? There's the Kurzweilian singularity scenario. I hate that stuff. Yeah. Well, I always figure whenever you see a rhetorical question, you can assume the answer is no. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's such a good uh, good rule of thumb. Every week, George, you tell me something that it's going to be really useful for me in living my life. That's well, good. I'm glad, glad. But, uh, yeah, that was, you know, I'd, I'd ignore that part of the article and just uh, urge people to read the rest just about Cien's particular theory because it's really, really seems really like an interesting way to think about this problem. But, That's true. nah, it, I don't it, think it, we're going to get downloaded into computers. And, ignore the uh, obligatory uplifting coda. Yeah, on yeah. Articles yeah. like this is what an editor saying. may have made him do that. Yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that's a, probably as good a place to wrap up as any. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, yeah. So um, I'm going to be around next week. Are you going to be around? Yeah, I'll be here. So um, yeah, what, shall we do it again? Sure. I look yeah. forward to it. Okay, sounds good, John. All right.